Uh, I'm going to take a little different uh, tact, I think, here today. Is a lot of my work with the manure has been sort of inspired by fecal coliforms and, and bacteriological water quality, and that's that's a pretty high bar. Um, because if you think about the, the concentration of fecal coliforms in, in manure and uh, and some of the pretty strict guidelines we have for partial body contact, it's, it doesn't take very much uh, to, to, to really um, contaminate a great deal of water. So it, it's a real challenge. Now, let's see. So I think before I get started on a land application, which I want to talk about mostly because, uh, you know, I'm concerned about the farmers that have to manage this on the landscape. But you know, I think it's important to, to think about some of the other opportunities we have. And there's really increasing interest now in looking at ways that we can really retain drainage water uh, from, from going in, into ditches and, and reuse that water for nutrients and or possibly for remediation of other contaminants in other ways. And one of those is saturated buffers. Uh, Jim Horman, who's after me, will talk about fall cover crops for retaining the nutrients and contaminants, uh, you know, in the, in the root zone. Certainly, constructed wetlands have an opportunity for us to to catch these uh, lightly contaminated water and uh, retain it for our remediation. Such as Baker Lads Farm here in Michigan, who has set up a system where he's uh, capturing the gray water, the the um, feed area runoff water, parlor wash water, and lot runoff water, and he's diverting that into a three-stage wetland for retention and some uh, remediation, and then, then using it, that as sub-irrigation water uh, to uh, provide water to 10, about 10 acres of corn ground and uh, increasing corn yields. So that's another opportunity. And, and also, I think anaerobic digestion is not going to have a big impact on the uh, nutrient content that may escape from the field, but certainly it, it's going to greatly uh, decrease the, the bacteriological loading that, that may leave with the site. So, I'll, so regarding land application, some key points that I'll cover. Uh, high, the high-risk soils are the fine-textured soils. Those are the ones that crack and, and uh, uh, have earthworm burrows and that type of thing, potential problems. Sandy loam soils are lower risk. Problems are likely if you're applying high rates, I'll talk about that, uh, on wet ground and when tile lines are flowing. So those are some little bit of red flags you've got to be careful. Uh, tillage will, can be used to break these preferential flow paths, the earthworm burrows and root channels and that type of thing. Uh, but if we think about our, our options, uh, both tillage and low rates are needed because it's not... Uh, kind of a buffet where we can pick either one. It's, it's a challenging situation, and we really need the combination of low rates and, uh, and some, some tillage to break the pores. And finally, you know, these tile lines need to be monitored because it, all soils are different. Uh, situations are a little bit unpredictable, and, and it's a challenge. So the problem, of course, is that soils are porous, and they need to be for root growth and drainage and all types of things, and, uh, but they leak. And these pictures on the right are a little a close-up picture of what you saw with Dr. Kleiman's uh, uh, field work with uh, Martin Shipitalo and Frank Gibbs, where they they're in Michigan putting on a demonstration for us. They're blowing smoke up the tile lines, and that's what you see there. And the message was, if the uh, smoke can come up from the tile line, certainly contaminants can move down fairly quickly, and you need to be aware of what some of your options are for that. And the issue is that we know the liquid manure uh, can move to subsurface drains literally within minutes of an application, and that's through these preferential flow channels, earthworm holes, soil cracks, other macropores, root channels, that type of thing. And again, the fine textured soils are the, are the high risk, higher risk. Sandy loam soils are not no risk, but lower risk when we think about the potential for um, contaminants from uh, land where we've applied uh, manure. Tillage, we talked about that as a way to break these uh, continuous flow channels, these macropores. And uh, again, if we're looking at no-till ground, it, we know that uh, injected manure has appeared within minutes from tile drains. So it's a challenge um, because no-till soils have more continuous flow channels than, than, uh, than tilled soils. Uh, and, and some type, some range of tillage you know, is uh, we can use it to our advantage by dis by disrupting these these macropores 
and that in turn delays manure movement and can greatly decrease uh, bacterial concentration in the effluent that we find. <coughs> Excuse me. So I've had good luck with this tool as an airway uh, applying manure. In fact, I've done a lot of work with uh, putting seed directly in the manure tank and, and uh, dropping it behind these tines, and, and that typically would be what the seed bed looks like below. But I think what's interesting about that, uh, the picture below, is that that's corn silage ground, very little residue, highly trafficked, hard, it's not going to infiltrate very well. But with this aeration type tool, which I, th I think is, is compatible with really low disturbance tillage that we, we like to have, is that we get this random roughness that's, that's really, I think you can see that it's going to help stabilize that manure slurry on the surface, keeping it from running and ponding, ponding even locally, and that's going to help uh, distribute those nutrients and contaminants in, in a way that, that we can retain those in the, in the root zone. But again, tillage alone is not going to solve the problem. We need high rates, or low rates rather, excuse me, but I think we need to think about opportunities for pre-tilling the soil. If we're using injectors, we, we want injectors with lots of tillage and mixing action, and Dr. Kleinman just, just showed you one of the options for that. Uh, or dropping the manure behind the rolling tines, which I've had very good luck with, uh, monitoring tile lines, uh, particularly with low rates. And if we're, if we, we're using a close injector spacing uh, with many tines, that's better than some of the old type of equipment that would be on 30-inch 30 30-inch centers with the large sweeps to basically slice the soil three or four inches below, lifted the soil, then flooded that zone, uh, exposing the, the preferential flow past the wormholes and then dropping the, the soil back on top. So certainly we, we're seeing some, uh, some advances in, in this. So the question is, right, what is the right amount of tillage? And I wish I had a prescriptive answer for you, but I don't because it's, obviously it's site-specific. Uh, it's going to depend on the terrain, the slope, the soil type, the timing, the crop, all those types of things. But certainly manure managers want to in inhibit movement to subsurface drains. That's going to be a, a primary issue. Uh, they want to also going to want to prevent overland flow, and you can have preferential flow over the surface as well, you, as, well as you can have it over, you know, down through the soil profile. They're going to want to minimize odor and distribute manure throughout the root zone for efficient crop use. So. You know, folks really have a lot of balls to keep in the air when it comes to land application of manure, and, and I, I certainly can sympathize with the challenges they have. Rates, again, I don't have a real, I don't have a prescription here for you. Uh, some of our folks in in Ontario have come to the conclusion that if it's on untilled ground, and they're on a fine textured soil, higher clay content soils, they probably have a tendency to, to shrink and crack. Um, but 3,600 gallons per acre, and that's if, if you do much mineral management, you that looks like a pretty low number to you, and, and it is. Um, but in my experience, so we've really had few problems with less than 6,000, 36 to 8,000 gallons per acre is usually what I think about uh, because I can usually work that out from an agronomic standpoint. But if we're using that with uh, a low application, with with pre tillage, like with that airway that I showed you, we we haven't had not, have not had any problems. Uh, but again, I mean, this is a natural system, and, and these things are driven largely by precipitation, and, and a high rainfall can really give it a push. You know, so that can kind of trump uh, a number of things. So again, what is what is the right application rate? Well, again, that that's going to depend because it depends on on the on how dilute is the slurry. A very dilute slurry is going to be much more flowable than a thick, viscous slurry. Uh, and it's going to affect the way it moves and, and the rate at which it moves. Uh, some folks have asked, well, how about the agronomic rate? Well, that's, that's a way to calculate a manure application rate, but it's based on soil tests, it's based on manure nutrient content and the crop requirements. And there's really nothing in that equation about the ability of the soil to retain that amount of volume in, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in, in the root zone, near the surface, right? and, and not let it escape through the tile line. So... Um, you know, agronomic rates certainly can provide some guidance for some things, but if we're using an agronomic rate with a very dilute slurry, a nutrient dilute slurry like a parlor wash water, a lot runoff, the calculation is going to lead you to a very high volume of slurry that's not going to be very uh, amenable to um, an application on tile drain land without moving through the uh, tile lines in most cases. Uh, one other thing folks have asked about is, well, what about the soil water holding capacity? 
Uh, that's we've got a number for that. We can look up soil, basic soils, and and, and uh, we, we've got a, a number for that. But the challenge with that is, and it makes us a little uneasy here in Michigan, is it really doesn't account for the preferential flow paths, and and those are really some of the things that, that cause. Some problems, so we're not we're not really excited about that either. Uh, we're real, I think, really expecting people to to monitor the tile lines, to uh, make adjustments on the fly if they see manure leaving the tile lines, then making adjustments either in rate or possibly uh, using plugs to to plug it, not on a annual basis, but sort of as an emergency uh, opportunity if, if they ever see they're running into problems. Timing also is an issue. Uh, we certainly want to apply when the soil is dry and the tiles are not running. So if you're managing manure, you're seeing your windows close on yourself really quick here. I understand that. Side dress time is one opportunity. Not real popular here in Michigan just because of the timing and potential for, for uh, soil compaction with, with some types of uh, heavy manure equipment. But um, some folks are doing it. After harvest, we see a lot of uh, are going out and it's probably the best time uh, you know in, in, in Michigan for this uh, but certainly we don't want to apply when rain is, ex is expected uh, fairly soon because that provides a lot of energy provides flowability and it, it provides a real push so that's where tile blocks if you run into a situation where uh, you're running into problems that tile blocks may be uh, appropriate not as an emergency uh, use so what we recommend, I think, are a suite of things. And again, it's not it's not a pick one. It's sort of a, uh, do a number of these things. And uh, we want to use soil conservation practices to prevent overland flow and localized ponding, which can either leave the site or localized ponding can really pond over tile lines, which is going to be an issue. So we really want to look at things that are going to keep, keep the manure application in place as soon as it hits the ground. Uh, we want to apply when the soil is dry and tiles are not flowing. Pre-tillage plus low rates, I think, is uh, is a message I want you to, to take back with you. Uh, we want to mi monitor tile outlets. The, the manure manager needs to be making the application, observing, evaluating, and making adjustments on the fly, and that can include changing rates or, or maybe changing from a go to a no-go situation, depending on what uh, the challenges are. Uh, consider all alternatives, such as I mentioned earlier, capturing that runoff water and, and reusing it for crop growth and more constructive uses. And keep in mind that uh, with the best intentions and the best management, heavy rain can still trump uh, trump everything we try and do with this type of a, a situation. So it's a real challenge. <laughs>